Hello, and welcome to this lecture recital. Thank you so much for coming out tonight to hear me talk a little bit about these two composers that is very dear to my heart. I want to start by saying that as an Indonesian pianist, it has always been fascinating to listen to how gamelan or other Indonesian traditional in instruments and music actually influence a lot of Western composer. But yet there is not much to say about Indonesian art music in general or how it functions um, within the larger um, scheme of things. Cultural influences, especially the idea of exoticism in Western art music, are common. But what about the Western influence in Eastern art music? How far does the influence carry? And what are its musical implications? Two composers, Claude Debussy and Ananda Sukarlan, are remarkable examples of such exchange, adaptation, and integration of outside culture into musical output. Through this lecture recital, focusing on piano repertoire, I will try to identify and analyze the connection between Western and Eastern cultural influence in music, including how prevalent the influence is and how it affects the musical aesthetic of these two composers by exploring Debussy Image, book two, and a couple of Sukarlan's Rhapsodia Nusantara. I would like to start this discussion with Debussy. Debussy's fascination with the East is very well known, particularly in his Pagods, the first piece of a stump. But how prevalent, again, is this influence? And how does it work within his musical aesthetic? Let's begin with a deeper look into Image. In the second book of Image for piano, written in 1907, Debussy was inspired by the musical elements of the East. It consists of three separate pieces. First of all, disclaimer, I don't really speak French, so forgive me for any pronunciation error. The first piece is Cloche à travers le feuille, Bells Through the Leaves, with rhythmic al allusion to Indonesian gamelan. The second piece is La Lune descend sur le temple qui fut. Whew. <laughs> translated as, as the moon descend to the temple that was, with tonality resembling that of Indian raga, and possibly many other allusions to various cultures, and poisson d'or, in reference to the koi in Japanese paintings. The idea of exoticism can be applied to image, image in various levels of integ integration. The idea of exoticism defined by Bellman as the borrowing or use of musical materials that evoke distant locales or alien frames of reference, a matter of compositional craft, of making the notes do something different from what they usually do. This definition, however, can be limiting in our perspective of exotic music, which prompts us to consider Ralph Locke's definition of musical exoticism. He defines this as, quote, the process of evoking in or through music whether the latter is exotic sounding or not, a place, people, or social milieu that is not entirely imaginary and that differs profoundly from the home country or culture in attitudes, customs, and morals. More precisely, it is the process of evoking a place that is perceived as different from home by the people making and receiving the exoticist cultural product. Locke's definition helps us open a world of possibility of how exoticism might be perceived in a musical context. Does the music have to sound exotic, that is, using exotic style, or can exoticism happen both with and without exotic style? This integration of musical language and exoticism is what he calls the full context paradigm of exoticism, where the work that is being analyzed does not have to, quote, display stylistic oddity at all. It is worth mentioning Adorno's 1928 Schubert article, where Adorno posed an idea of exoticism in Schubert's music, evoking a culture which never in fact existed, where, quote, transcendental distance become directly accessible to him. Schubert himself function in a language that is a dialect, but it is a dialect from nowhere. It has a flavor of a native, yet there is no such place, only a memory. Using Ralph Locke's notion of exoticism with and without exotic style, we can try to focus on how Debussy incorporated the exotic elements 
but at the same time, translating it into French aesthetic. Eastern elements, both in musical characteristics and the idea of symbolism, can be traced in image. But how exotic is this music, technically? The first piece, Bells Through the Leaves, is known to have been inspired by Indonesian gamelan. Looking from a historical perspective, Debussy was introduced and became infatuated with the Javanese gamelan that he saw in the 1899 International Exposition in Paris. In 1913, he wrote, quote, there was once and there is still, despite the evils of civilization, a race of delightful people who learned music as easily as we learn to breathe. Their academy is the eternal rhythm of the sea, the wind in the leaves, thousands of tiny sounds which they listen to attentively without ever consulting arbitrary treatises. Debussy didn't specifically talk about image when he wrote this, but we can see his infatuation with the elements of the gamelan and how it functions within society. Even though bells, even though, whoa, even though bells through the leaves can be easily connected to the influence of gamelan, there is another possibility of how this piece could be understood or thought of. Louis Lalois wrote a letter to Debussy about the time that he was composing this piece. He wrote about the sound of church bells on All Saints' Day in French villages, and also the custom between Vespers and Mass for the Dead, when the bells toll from village to village across the golden woods in the quiet of the evening. Whether or not this piece is directly or indirectly influenced by either or both of these influences, we can only make assumption but a thorough look into the music can provide to be enlightening. Many aspects of the music could support this possible influences quite clearly. In terms of texture, cloche is evocative of multiple layers of sound that characterize gamelan music. Gamelan's texture is constructed by stacking of rhythmically subdivided levels of sound with each layer played by different instrument that functions within a cycle. Gamelan is formed with combinations of various instruments in register and timbre, with the gong as the lowest sounding instrument. The gong keeps the cycle, while the other instruments build upon it with variations of rhythmic complexity, tunes, as well as harmonies. In the first few measure of cloche, we can see how layers of sound are built upon different paces of rhythm, variety of register, and also duration, as you can see in your handout, example one. The specific articulations that Debussy inscribes show us the details of which he conceptualized the different layers of sound, which will need to be carefully executed in performance. Accents, tenuto, marcato, and staccato markings within or not within a slur must be observed very carefully with consideration of note length, the conception, and execution of sound colors, as well as pedaling. In terms of tonality, Debussy combines various scales whole tone, chromatic, diatonic, pentatonic, octatonic, like literally everything that you can find under the sun, which creates a risk contrast and also blend to the overall harmonic structure and resonance in the piano. Evocative of Gamelan's heterophonic texture, cloche, and later on, et la lune, shows Debussy's significant effort to create similar texture in Western art music, which later on is taken by another composers, such as Boulez, Messiaen, and Britton. Cloche, however, is written in a traditional ternary form with synthesis in tonality, rhythmic motives, and thematic materials at the return, which lends a sense of familiarity despite the exotic influences. Debussy never specifically identified the influence of gamelan in cloche or Lalois letters influence for that matter. However, the notion of certain images being evoked in the music would also suggest the possibilities of prevailing influence. Bells through the leaves. It suggests a hearing outside where nature and music become intertwined. Just as nat nature and visual art were becoming to integral integrally entwine among contemporaneous impressionist painters. Gamelan, being a metal instrument that is struck with a mallet, has a similar quality to bells in terms of resonance and timbre. As a communal activity that provides a sense of social and cultural obligations in Indonesia, both in Java and in Bali, gamelan is usually played outside, where the music is interacting with the nature that is all around. Both religious and cultural ceremonies would employ the use of this instrument, 
and its function is very much integrated within society. This image, however, can also be easily replaced by Laloa's descriptions of bells ringing through French villages, which is also tied to religious and cultural aspects of life. The duality of which we can think of the image portrayed is very much reflected in the music, where one could not say for certain whether cloche is influenced by the East or the West. As Roberts puts it, the bells of Jura can only have merged with the potent memory of the gamelan. Locke's idea of submerged exoticism defined as, quote, a tendency for general musical style to incorporate distinctive scales, harmonies, orchestral colors, and other features that had previously been associated with the exotic realms can be applied here. Similar claim could also be made for Ravel's La Vallée des Cloches, the Valley, the Valley of Bells from Miroir, which written essentially during the same time. The ambiguity of the piece and the juxtapositions of elements do not make the image or the music less powerful. It just gives more possibilities of how one could interpret this piece. While the influence in Cloche might be easily determined, it is the complete opposite with El Lune. The title, and the moon sets over the temple that was, as translated by Roberts, already presents an enigma by use of vocabulary, syntax, and grammar. The many possible interpretations of the title, however, could be related to Debussy's fascination with symbolism. As Mallarmé puts it, to name an object is to suppress three quarters of the pleasure of a poem. To suggest, herein lies the dream. Et la lune then suggests quite a number of possibilities. Boulez described the piece as, quote, the transmutation of oriental influences at the deepest level, a, a piece in which oriental concepts of time and sonority are clearly determined, while Courtois' commentary suggests a place on which time has, has set his hand as the misty night falls on the dreamy silence of its ruins. The ambiguity of the title is reflected in the music, both in terms of identifying exotic influences and standard musical elements, such as tonality, rhythmic materials, and texture. Howard argues that there are elements of Indian music presented here, but unfortunately, it is not quite as easy for us to pinpoint. Juxtapositions of various elements and influences, Indian, Japanese, Chinese, and even some allusion to the gamelan as well, permeates throughout the piece. The oriental associations with the idea of a temple is further emphasized by La Loa, the dedicatee of the, of the piece, who defines the title as, quote, in Chinese style. The chant-like melodic idea in El Lune can be seen in your handout, um, example two, can be related to a fragment titled Buddha in one of Debussy's sketchbook around 1907 and 1908, which was intended for Victor Segalin's Buddhist drama called Siddhartha. This fragment of a melody in Et la Lune, clearly in Debussy's mind, tries to emulate Indian musical feature. A similar melodic material is also found in Ravel's Le Paon from Histoire Naturelle, characterized as a quasi-Chinese and uses similar ornamentation. However, Debussy's real exposure with Indian music technically did not happen until a meeting with an Indian Sufi in Khan in May 1913 which brings us back to the idea of exotic influence in this piece. Is it Indian? Or is it what Debussy thought might be Indian? And is Indian the only influence that we can find here? Or is there any other allusion to any other cultures? As ambiguous as it is, the piece gives us verbal cues from the composer, and that chant-like melody that is presented in the music becomes a musical allusion to the context of what the title suggests. The influence of the exotic here, while not being as musically obvious and contributing little to our understanding of the piece, certainly brings a pictorial sense to mind. The notion of dreams, a suggestion of something that is never quite defined as portrayed by the title, creates a conundrum in terms of a performance. How can a performance suggest something? Isn't every performance technically a suggestion? As one performer's interpretation could be different from the others. In this piece, this idea of suggestive images could be interpreted as vagueness of sound, as if the sound comes from very far away, distorted and quite unclear. 
Debussy's use of chromaticism and added notes in the beginning of the piece adds to this ambiguity of sound, tonality, and resonance, as if the overtones are so complex that we cannot have a perfect fifth sonority, something that we can hold on to in terms of tonality. Dynamic markings that never goes anywhere louder than a piano conveys the notion of dreamlike state to a whole new level, as if the listeners are not quite sure whether or not they actually hear the music. Of course, decibel level is not just the only concern in terms of performance, but also the use of color and how much focus the sound should be displayed. The quest to establish whether exoticism permeates in this piece then become more than just identifying the musical features that contributes to the wholeness of the piece. Unlike Cloche, El Alun's exoticism is built from more than just one facet of the music. Flock's idea of exoticism with and without exotic style comes back with this piece as a representation of both. The dichotomy and ambiguity of how this element work together, the subtle shift from one tonality to the others, and the use of sonority define its identity. Exoticism, in this case, is presented as a nuance, both influenced by the musical and non-musical feature in such a way that is inseparable, where one cannot exist without the other. The goldfish, pushing the boundaries even more further than Cloche and Ed La Lune, brings us even further away in the realm of exoticism, since it is written almost entirely without any exotic style. Poisson Tau was, was said to have been inspired by, quote, a small Japanese lacquer wooden panel, an exotic and beautiful creation depicting two gold-colored fish against, against a jet black, black, ooh, jet black background that Debussy owned. Sorry. The details in the painting, from the exultant and sensual motions of the fish to the delicately curved lines and patterns of flowing golden seaweed, conveys a sense of refinement of this modest piece of visual art, its breadth of rich exoticism overlying an inherent simplicity. Sounds familiar? That's kind of Debussy's general aesthetics. Tracing the elements of the exoticism in this piece, however, inevitably involves a degree of speculation. In terms of tonality, texture, melodic quality, or rhythm, there is really nothing quite exotic. And yet the idea of exoticism is clearly conveyed by the image evoked by the title. An allusion to jazz influence could be identified in the middle of the piece, as you can see in your example 3B especially since Debussy was at the same time also working on Children's Corner, written in 1906-1908, with the last movement written as a cakewalk. The, the improvisatory character of jazz, rhythm flexibility, as well as the use of harmonic progression could be an element of exoticism in a musical sense, but it has no relation to the Japanese koei evoked in the title. These juxtapositions of influences elicit quite a different perspective of exoticism than the previous two pieces of image. Poisson, then, could be considered as the most traditional out of the three. It provides the greatest clarity in terms of musical elements, yet it is the most puzzling in trying to determine the connection between the music and the extra musical detail. How exotic is this music, actually? And is it enough to call it exotic because of a title that might be inspired by a Japanese painting? This piece, more than anything else, is a virtuosic piece that not only requires high technical proficiency, but also the combination of extreme opposites and means of expression, from the nuances of soft passages to the powerful climax utilizing the full resonance of the instrument. Debussy's idea of virtuosity, however, is not comparable and should not be compared to his predecessors in the Romantic era. As Poisson, quote, serves an exultant humor and joie de vivre far removed from romantic angst. Not that Debussy didn't write virtuosic pieces. <laughs> L'Ile Joyeuse, for example, would be one of Debussy's output that exemplified the kind of romantic virtuosity that we know he had acquired from his years at the Paris Conservatoire. As an accomplished pianist himself, Debussy's virtuosity and distinctive great pianist sound has been captured in many piano roles, as documented by Howitt. However, this particular non-romantic virtuosity and attitude towards pianism is obviously characterized by his own presence at the piano. With his composition for the instruments, quote, 
reveal an understanding of the instrument second to none, and many who have heard him play towards the end of his life marveled at the quality of sound he could produce. Freedom, grace, elegance, simplicity, and the immaterial. These five, according to Doomsnail memoir and its recollection of the insightful words of Debussy, need to be searched for and brought to life. But Roberts argue that the imagination is not enough for this piece, where one needs the nerve of a virtuoso, the willingness to take risk, to respond to the audacity of the music, and to its air of improvisatory freedom, and above all, to recognize the humor. Looking at the dedicatee of the piece, Ricardo Vignes, who is a Spanish virtuoso pianist who premiered much of French and Spanish music, including Ravel's notorious Scarbo, an assumption could be made about Debussy's initial intention for the piece. To have a piece played by Vignes is to declare a certain flair of virtuosity. And so pianism of transcendental kind can definitely be thought of as one of the many influences for this piece. Musically direct, organic, and logical, Poisson presents a different type of ambiguity in terms of its association between the title, the influence, the music, and the evoked imagery. The gracefulness of the melodic idea paired with an active accompaniment, almost to the point of aggression, as you can see in your handout, example 3A, creates a musical language that is both contrasting but yet blend well together. Just like the image of Kois in a pond give a sense of serenity for us, their physical motion in order to swim is actually very vigorous. The duality of the same imagery presented from two different perspectives be becomes the center in Poisson, just like the idea of exoticism to be presented with or without exotic style. Is this piece exotic then? The answer is yes, even though the exoticism that is portrayed lies more in the ideas conveyed instead of in the music. The presentation of something that is familiar and yet evoke distant locales is translated into the duality of stillness and agitation, just like swimming coys in the pond. Now that we have seen exotic influences in three different settings by Debussy, we can kind of shift gears and see how this exotic culture could be mirrored from the other side. Ananda Sukarlan is an Indonesian composer and pianist who was born and raised in Jakarta, studied in the Netherlands, and resides in Spain. His Rhapsodia Nusantara, or translated to be Rhapsody of the Archipelago, are a collection of mostly virtuosic pieces written for solo piano and each based on a particular folk tune or tunes sometimes. These pieces were inspired by Liszt Hungarian rhapsodies, not least in the sense that they carry in them some sense of national identity. As much as the raw material is Indonesian, they are clearly influenced by the Western piano tradition. As a Western-trained classical pianist, Sukarlan employs various common classical, romantic, and impressionistic compositional approaches. Two Rhapsodia Nusantara will be presented in this lecture recital to further emphasize the idea of cultural mirroring and its adaptation and integration into his personal musical language and aesthetic, while still maintaining the integrity of both Indonesian and Western identities. Starting with the 10th Rhapsodia Nusantara, we can see his attempt to transcribe the sound of gamelan as directly to piano as possible. Inspired by the sound of the instruments and based on a Balinese folk tune, Janger, this 10th Rhapsody focuses on the idea of virtuosity, but yet stays within the same aesthetic of its inspiration. Similar to Cloche, this piece makes use of the idea of subdivision and layers of sound, evocative of gamelan's heterophonic texture. But as to emulate the gamelan faithfully, Sukarlan uses a version of Pelog, which is a pentatonic scale that uses scale degree one, three, four, five, seven in major scale throughout the whole piece. Pianistic tendencies occur everywhere in this piece, and it is clearly written with a Western pianism in mind. The composer himself, when asked about this, said that the idea of counterpoint is clearly presented and that the various layers, especially towards the end, with the tremolo in the lower voice in the right hand, as you can see in your example 4A, reminds him of the third movement of the Waldstein Sonata, even if it's just in the technical execution. 
It is also worth mentioning that Sukarlan uses similar writing style and effects to Debussy's chant passage in Et la Lune, evocative, from bells, evocative of bells from afar, as you can see in your example 4B. In a way, exoticism that is displayed in this piece is very much locked exoticism without exotic style, in that Sukarlan is trying to completely emulate the traditional music in a non-traditional instrument. But of course, we can argue that the use of a Western instrument already evokes distant locales, and that this music wouldn't be played in this instrument or in this setting, for that matter. The second one, Rhapsodia Nusantara number eight, however, could not be more different. It is a clear example of exoticism where it employs the exotic style almost exclusively. Then again, it seems quite ironic for me to say that what I call exotic style in this particular piece is common practice period harmonic progressions, Western form formal structure, and Western pianism techniques. This rhapsody is based on a folk tune from a province of North Sulawesi called O Inani Keke. The opening passages actually recalls the beginning of one of the early 20th century's most influential piano sonatas written by Alban Berg, published in 1910, which in my mind is quite an appropriate opening to establish the idea of structure and form right away. Even though technically this rhapsody is not written in sonata form, but as a theme and variations. Exemplifying the Western pianistic tradition in terms of technique, harmony, and form, it is one of the clearest examples of Western influence in Indonesian art music. His musical aesthetic and language, however, is quite idiosyncratic, and that the music sometimes moves in an unexpected manner. Looking through the different variations, we can see the influence of counterpoint, Lyscian passages with arpeggios and octaves all across the keyboard, and the first variation, as Sukarlan says himself, is inspired by second movement of Apashinara, even though it doesn't stay like that for very long. Again, we ask, the we ask the question, what is the balance in this music between the Indonesian and the Western? Does incorporation, assimilation, and integration of another culture change how we are able to, and perhaps should, perceive this music? The answer, in my opinion, is yes. It is important for us as interpreters to realize how big a task we are given to try to understand what this music is built upon whether directly or indirectly. It happens in this case that what the music is built upon is the idea of cultural mirroring between the East and the West. Just like Image gives us a variety of which exoticism can be understood, absorbed, and depicted in various ways and degrees of influence, so does Sukarlan's pieces, but from the other side. The depth of which the exotic style permeates this piece goes from the surface level to full integration and later on is also contextualized within the composer's own aesthetic and compositional styles. Does this all make the music Western or Eastern or both? I would like to think that each of them still maintains their own integrity, but it is worth acknowledging the Western influence in Indonesian art music, just as we recognize and acknowledge Eastern influence in Debussy's music with or without exotic style. With the presence of this global exchange, it is worthwhile to think about how far these influences carry and how culture, art, and music can influence people significantly. Perhaps we can think of it as a tribute as we approach the centenary of Debussy's death in 1918 to his extraordinary modernistic vision that he was addressing creative issues in the early 20th century that are clearly still alive in our own times in a country and culture 7,000 miles from Paris. Thank you. <laughs>